And um, yeah, so it's a very interesting time. It's a little strange for me to be teaching about plants online. I never thought that I would be doing that at least this much. So um, just bear with me because it's, you know, there's always bound to be possible technical issues, but hopefully it will be great. Um, I would love to take questions. So if you have any questions, please type them in uh, that little chat box. If you just go down to the bottom of your screen where it says chat and click on that, you can type a question in there and Isa will be helping me to moderate those. And um, I may not answer them right away if I'm in the middle of a thought, or I may ask to answer them later at the end. Uh, but I will also be doing some Q and A's after we're finished. So you can also save your questions for after. But again, thank you so much for being here. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can start this slideshow. All right. Okay, so here we go. Gonna play it. Okay, if you can see this, can you just like nod your head or give me a little thumbs up? Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, so here we go. Um, and this title is Antiviral Herbs in the Garden and Wild Places. And I want to thank Bountiful City so much for having me here. I really believe in the work that they're doing. So please support them as well. And let's get into this. Okay, so this is my disclaimer, which I have to give whenever I talk about herbs, because unfortunately there's a lot of legalities to being an herbalist in the United States. So um, please do your research, check with your health practitioner before you take any herb, especially if you're pregnant, nursing, or have any health issues. Um, I am not a doctor and I do not have a license to practice medicine. So I just wanna put that out there right away. Everything that I'm sharing with you is from my own research, um, my own education, my own knowledge. And um, just like food allergies, anyone can have an allergy to any herb. So you may react to one that nobody else reacts to. So just be aware that not every herb is great for every person. Okay, so this is me and my company, my business is called The Wander School. And The Wander School is actually an acronym for the Wild Artemisia Nature Discovery Empowerment and Reconnection School. Um, so yeah, and then you see uh, kind of my motto there is inspiring nature connection and health empowerment. So I believe that a lot of our common health issues have really been um, spawned or exaggerated from disconnection with nature and each other. And through that reconnection, we can empower ourselves with our own healthcare. So I'm excited to be here today to be helping to empower you with your healthcare. Um, I'll give you a little bit about my background and what I do. I'll just give you the short version because it could go on and on. But um, as it says right there, I'm an herbalist, botanist, and forager. I am also an author, so you'll see my book at the end, but some of the information in this slideshow comes from my book, The Herbal Handbook for Homesteaders, which if you would like to get yourself a copy, I would love it if you got it from my website, which is right there, thewanderschool.com, because I get to keep a lot more of the profits that way, and I'll sign it for you. Uh, but it's all about farmed and foraged herbal remedies and tells you how to forage safely, how to grow your own herbs, and how to make lots and lots of herbal remedies. So um, yeah, where to start? I spent most of my life in Ohio in the Midwest. And um, my mom is actually here. Hi, mom. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I was really lucky. I have to thank my mom, my dad for that, that 
they always let me run wild in the woods behind our houses and climb behind, yeah, our various houses we lived in and climb trees, play in creeks, which I was so lucky to have around my house. I know a lot of people don't, but if you have children, you're around children, I would highly recommend that. And um, so that's really how I got into this. When people ask me, how'd you get involved in this? That was, that was my start. Um, and then I uh, started working at health food stores when I got into my late teens and working on farms. I moved out west and um, worked on a farm in Oregon. And so I learned about growing plants and herbs. I um, met a Native American family who lived down the street from me and actually ended up living with them. And so I learned more about herbal medicine and the spirituality of herbs. And I also lived in California for a while, um, went to all these different schools trying to find where I fit and couldn't find anything until I actually came back to Ohio and I had my daughter who became my herbal guinea pig. And so um, when I had her, I wanted to do everything naturally. And so I started learning more about that and about herbs and herbs for kids. And um, yeah, and so then a few serendipitous things happened. I started my own herbal tea business so I could work from home with my daughter. And while I was vending at the farmer's market, I met an herbalist who became my mentor and who I've been studying with for a very long time, about 16 years now. And her name is Leslie Williams. I think it's important that we share those things. And um, then several years later, I found out that a father from my daughter's class was going to Miami University, which is actually in Ohio because it's named after the Miami Native American tribe and was studying botany. And so I went to Miami University, studied botany, got a degree in botany. And I also taught myself a lot just by wandering through the woods with some good field guides and herb books. I wouldn't recommend that way of learning because it's a lot harder and you have to be really sure always of what you're putting into your body um, that you have the proper identification. So that's really important um, and we'll probably talk more about that, but just in case I forget, like you always want to have 100% positive identification. That's always what I say when we are harvesting wild plants before we ingest anything. So, uh, yeah, my website is thewanderschool.com. I do all kinds of cool things. Um, usually teach in person until now, but I do have a plant walk coming up in Burnsville that will be socially distanced. Um, on September 12th. So if you want to check that out, I would love it if you came. It will be, we'll be talking about um, wild herbs and wild edibles. And um, ongoing education on Patreon at patreon.com slash the wonder school. I have my book. I do botanical property surveys if you want to learn what's growing on your land. And private plant walks. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Also, I wanted to mention um, that I just filed for nonprofit status. So I'm really excited because I think these values line up with Bountiful Cities and I'll be um, making herbs accessible to communities in need. That will be the main part, but also botanical education. So um, please contact me if you wanna learn more about that. Uh, so let's get into it. Here we go. <laughs> Put, I put some really funny pictures in here because like it's a slideshow and can get really boring. So I wanted to keep y'all awake, especially mid afternoon post lunchtime. So this is kind of a funny picture, but um, we're talking about antiviral herbs. There's a lot of different antiviral herbs, but you can take all the herbs or all the medicines in the world but if the rest of your life is crazy, you're under tons of stress all the time, you're not eating well or getting exercise, then those supplements or medications aren't gonna help very much. So I just wanted to remind everyone of the basics. Um, and I feel like first and foremost is decreasing stress. We're all under so much stress these days, especially with what's going on in the world right now. 
So if you can find techniques to decrease your stress, please do. Um, and please make time for them. Um, hydrating with good, healthy liquids, so clean water, especially herb teas would be great. And exercise every day. Lots of antioxidant foods, so that's where this picture comes in, eat the rainbow. So eat vegetables and fruits of all colors, and that'll give you lots of antioxidants to help you fight off viruses and diseases. Um, breathe. We often forget this one, but just stopping during the day, multiple times a day, and taking deep breaths. You can set the alarm on your phone for it to go off once an hour, and just take you know, three to nine deep breaths, and it will help so much in your body. Um, sleep and rest are a huge one. I know a lot of people with stress aren't getting a whole lot, and it's like this vicious cycle. So if you're not getting a lot of sleep and rest because you're under stress, then you're gonna be more stressed and you're not gonna sleep well. So um, try to get as much rest as you can. And then do things that bring you joy. I think this is the thing we forget about a lot of the time, but things that bring you joy, some kind of play, what makes you happy, and having a spiritual practice in your life, and community, which is really hard right now, obviously. But if we can have Zoom chats or small gatherings, a hike in the woods with a friend, it's really important for our health. Okay, so let's talk about the nitty gritty herbs. Kitchen herbs are superheroes. They are. So first and foremost, I would say the easiest thing to do is look in your kitchen cabinet, in your spice rack, and see what you have in there because a lot of those herbs are most likely antiviral. And we're going to talk about some, there's a lot more than what we're going to talk about today probably in your spice rack right now, especially, especially if you like to cook. Um, but we're just going to talk about some that are easy to grow. And a lot of these you can grow in pots as well. So as I said, there's so, so many that we can grow in our garden. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about a bunch from the mint family because a lot of them are what we call antimicrobial herbs. And so antimicrobial means basically that they fight microbes. And microbes can be a number of different things. They're like little tiny creatures um, that can live in our bodies that are sometimes good and sometimes not good. And so this could definitely be viruses or bacteria. It could also be things like fungus or parasites. So just know if I say antimicrobial, it means a wide range, but especially including viruses and bacteria. Um, so basil is antimicrobial and it's what we call a nervine in herbalism. A nervine is kind of what it sounds like. It's something that calms your nervous system. So as I was saying before, the more stressed we are, the more likely we are to get sick. So I want to... Um, say another disclaimer that this slideshow is not just about COVID. One, because I could get in trouble for making any claims that anything works against COVID. Two, we don't really honestly know a whole lot about COVID yet and how it works and what herbs work specifically for it. So I'm going to approach this in a broader view as far as here are a lot of options for antiviral herbs. And a lot of them you can ingest as food, which is the easiest way to get herbs into our bodies. Um, and a lot of them you can take on a daily basis, pretty safely remembering that anybody could have a reaction to anything. So basil, a lot of us have grown basil. It's um, put a little too easy to grow because it can spread pretty easily, just like any other mint family plant but not as easily as some other mint family plants. Um, here in North Carolina, it's an annual, and we can grow it from seed after the frost. Uh, it's important to thin it out when you're growing it from seed, so just meaning like 
picking out some of the seedlings so that they have room to grow and spread out because they end up taking a fair amount of room, like up to a foot per plant. So that's important to remember. I um, made some garden beds recently and I'm practicing, it's pretty much square foot gardening. So basically one square foot for each plant and it works pretty well. Um, these mint family plants can also be good companion plants. So they um, tend to either attract the bugs that we want to keep out of the garden and keep them to these mint plants so they don't get on our vegetables or repel those, those pests. So it's really nice to surround our vegetables by aromatic herbs, right? Things that smell pretty strongly. They don't have to smell bad, they can smell good. And then, uh, oh, don't let them bolt. So if you don't know what that means, it means when they start to flower. So if we keep picking the tops of the basil off, it won't flower. Um, because once it flowers, it's not bad for you. It just gets bitter. It's not as tasty. Uh, but the, the plant also doesn't seem to do as well once it starts flowering. So um, yeah, when I harvest them, I tend to just like take, if you can see this picture of what's in this pot, that very front plant of basil, it has two sets of leaves on top and they grow in pairs, what's called opposite leaf arrangement. I am a botanist, I have to say that. So um, you can harvest them right below like that second pair of leaves just by pinching them with your fingers or you can use scissors or a knife or pruners. And um, if you do that right above or right below where the leaf hits the stem, it actually stimulates regrowth of the plant. So we don't want to cut right in the middle of the stem. We want to cut right below or right above a set of leaves. And then it will keep growing. Um, and then at the end of the season, we can just harvest the whole plant or even pull, we can pull the whole plant out and we can just cut it low to the ground. And, um, we can dry it. I feel like sometimes basil doesn't dry very well, but you can, you can dry it. But a lot of folks I know will preserve it by making pesto and then freezing the pesto. And especially if you don't put cheese in there, it will preserve better and be easier to thaw and still taste good. Uh, if you put a little bit of lemon juice in there with it, it won't turn like brown or black. Uh, you can also add it to salad dressing, any kind of Italian sauce, um, like pasta sauce or pizza sauce. Obviously add it to your cooking as a flavoring. Just remember like there's so many ways we can cook up these herbs and get them into our body in tasty ways. Most people don't think about this, but we can also throw it into tea. For some people it's too strong, but other people like it. It's um, related to another herb we're gonna talk about in a minute called holy basil or Tulsi, which I like the taste of a little bit better, but I would put either into a tea and they're again, both nervines. So they're gonna be soothing for our nervous system. Okay, so this is almost like the old song, <laughs> parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, right? So if you think about these kinds of herbs, um, actually, all four of these herbs are also in the mint family, so they grow pretty easily for most of us. And um, these four are actually perennials, uh, and they are all antimicrobial, and we harvest the leaves of all of these. We can harvest them just like we harvested the basil and harvest the tops until the end of the season, and it will keep growing really well. Um, these four dry really easily, so just, um, yeah, you can harvest a bunch and just keep drying it, putting it away. I like to store my herbs in glass jars out of direct sunlight to keep them good longer. And then um, any of these would be great in an herbal steam, but especially thyme. So when I say herbal steam, what I mean is like getting a big metal pot, preferably not aluminum, but a big steel pot and um, putting just a little bit of water in the bottom 
and then like a pinch of these herbs you could also add some essential oils and just a few drops of essential oils um, or these as essential oils and heat it up on the stove just till it starts to simmer turn it off put it like on a table with something under it so it doesn't burn your table and then put your head over it with a towel over your head in the pot making sure it's not too hot it's not burning your face and then just sit there for like five to ten minutes and you can um, put a lid on this after that keep it on the stove and reheat it several times a day keep using that same herb infused water and it's really awesome for clearing out your sinuses so if you're really mucusy or you have a virus um, or some kind of sinus infection it's really helpful for that it will also get that antimicrobial action into your sinuses. Um, we can also make teas of these and tomato sauce again, and we can infuse them into oil as well. So it might be really tasty for like a dipping oil, something like that, or um, combine it with some vinegar and make a vinaigrette. And it's pretty delicious. Okay garlic. So garlic is in the lily family, which is very confusing because I did a lot of research. I kind of like went down the rabbit hole in this one, which often have it happens. But um, as I was double checking on the family, it said that online that um, garlic was in two other families. <laughs> so it's a little confusing, but I've always heard it's in the lily family and um, onions as well. They're kind of interchangeable. I feel like maybe garlic is a little bit stronger, but either one is a great antimicrobial in the same family. Um, we can plant garlic from the cloves of the garlic in mid-autumn or early spring. So you could just like, you know, if you get your garlic from the farmer's market or the grocery store, say it starts to sprout, and just put that right in your soil and it will grow. It's amazing. Um, it really does need full sun, well-drained soil, and try to find varieties that will keep for a long time. Sometimes like those hardneck garlics seem to keep a little bit longer. You want to cure them, so that means um, basically leaving them out in a dry place with pretty good air ventilation. Um, to kind of harden them up and keep them for long-term storage. And then you can do fun things with them like this picture and you can braid them and it looks beautiful. So the best way to get garlic into our system, again, is just to eat it. So just throw it in to everything that you eat. I know some folks who, when they start to feel sick, they'll just eat raw garlic. That like really irritates my stomach. So I don't do that, but you could like, take raw garlic, chop it up, throw it into things like hummus or sauces or things like that and eat it like that. Um, it's really, it's gonna be spicier when it's fresh. So just keep that in mind if you're not a spicy person. Uh, we can also make something called fire cider. And so I have a recipe for this in my book, The Herbal Handbook for Homesteaders. It's interesting, you should, if you don't know about fire cider, totally, look it up. I think they still have up the website free fire cider. There was a ton of controversy over it and when I wrote my book I actually had to call it fire tonic um, because there was a company that was trying to trademark that name. But it was freed so yay fire cider for the people. Um, fire cider is this combination every herbalist seems to have their own recipe but it is um, basically apple cider vinegar, hot peppers, garlic, um, horseradish, and then whatever else you want to throw in. I like to throw in locally grown turmeric and ginger and um, all of those herbs. Oh, and some black pepper too because it helps with the absorption of the turmeric and the ginger. And um, all of those herbs are really great for supporting our immunity for some of them for our digestion and for our circulation. So especially as it gets colder, just take little shots of that and it will help keep you warm. 
Um, and pepper vinegar was like hot pepper vinegar is actually a uh, traditional Appalachian medicine. And so people would just infuse hot peppers into vinegar and um, drink it when they were starting to feel sick. And it's really, it really, really works. But if you're a person who doesn't do spicy, you could do less spicy peppers. So maybe like jalapenos or something like that. Put other herbs in there that could calm that down a little bit. Um, and then you could also put garlic in so many things, but look up recipes. You can make a syrup with garlic and or onions um, with honey. And you can, there's this delicious recipe. Um, I don't have the book in front of me, but there's this old book by Jeannie Rose, who is an aromatherapist. And she has a recipe in there for 40 clove garlic soup. And it's delicious but you can find other garlic soup recipes. You can roast garlic, of course, and you can add it into butter, and that's really yummy. So, sky's the limit on garlic and different ways to eat it. Next, we have hot peppers. So, um, I love this picture because I love it. It's so funny to watch the peppers grow up like that. And hot peppers are in the nightshade family, so it's really important to remember um, if you have a nightshade allergy, like to things like tomatoes or potatoes, um, eggplants, you might not do well with peppers either. And um, also, if you have issues like arthritis, sometimes things in the nightshade family can cause inflammation and pain. Uh, you can grow peppers from seed or you can buy plants and you can start them inside, plant them in well-drained fertile soil in full sun with plenty of room in between plants so they can spread out. And like we just talked about pepper vinegar or fire cider and then um, be careful with hot peppers if you have issues with heartburn or gallbladder issues because it can aggravate those things. All right, so lemon balm. Um, lemon balm is actually a pretty powerful herb, but it's nice because its effect um, is mild in that like it's not, it, it's not like dangerous or heroic in its actions. Um, for most of us, we can tolerate it pretty well. And it, but most of us probably don't think about it as medicinal. We just think about it as this tasty herb. It's great in tea, but it is a wonderful antiviral. And um, I did put the Latin names in here too, because I am a botanist, but also because sometimes it's easy to confuse different herbs. They might be called multiple names in English or the same plant might have multiple um, names. So let's see, yeah, also in the mint family. <laughs> and these mint family herbs can spread really easily. So before you plant any of them, you really wanna think about, do you have room for them to spread? Are you planting them in an area where they can spread and you're not gonna get upset if they do, or would you rather plant them in a pot, which they work really well, um, that way too, but I wanted to put this picture in because it shows you like they really grow very prolifically. Uh, so they are wonderful antiviral, but especially for the herpes virus. And a lot of times when we say herpes virus, people think, oh, um, just genital herpes, but there's lots of herpes viruses out there. So cold sores are one that people don't often think about as a herpes virus. Chicken pox and shingles are all herpes viruses. And um, so just remember that. Uh, we can also, for things like cold sores and shingles, we can take it internally, but also topically. And it's a wonderful nervine. So I really wanted to include lots of nervines here, lots of tonics for a nervous system um, in this difficult time. So great for um, calming our nervous system and great for kids because it's so delicious. They really love it and you can use it 
to mask the flavor of bitter herbs. So nice for that as well. We harvest it like other mints, taking, um, you could either just take the tops like basil or with mints, you can also just harvest it right above the bottom two sets of leaves, leaving some to regrow. And for these, the leaves are the part that we want. So what I usually do is dry these and then just like if you've ever stripped basil, you can strip lemon balm the same way. So just hold your stem upright, make like a circle kind of or a C out of your hand and just pull down. And once they're dry, they'll come off really easily. Uh, so yeah, but the tricky thing about some mint family herbs is that if we dry them too quickly or too with too much heat, they'll turn brown or black. And it's they're probably not as good for you then. I don't think they're bad for you, but you've lost some of that vitality and it just doesn't look very appetizing. So I try to dry them low and slow. So this is one you could just put in a basket as long as it has some air circulation and it's not really moist in your environment. Um, you could also dry them on a low temperature slowly in a dehydrator. But I, I know some people who will dry herbs in their car in the sun. I would definitely not do that with mint family herbs because um, they are gonna turn brown. So as I said, it's a delicious tea or in tincture. So if you don't know, tincture is um, an extract of an herb, usually in alcohol, could be in vinegar or glycerin and can help mask bitter flavors. So peppermint, um, this is pretty similar for spearmint as well. So just so you know, again, another very easy to grow mint family herb antiviral. Doing the research for this, I found out that peppermint is actually helpful for herpes viruses as well, which I didn't know. Um, and I guess I was going to say too, before I forget, that I think most of, I think all of the herbs that I've mentioned so far um, are pretty safe for most of us for everyday use and for prevention of viruses. There are some we'll talk about later that are more for fighting viruses, um, but these are pretty good for every day as a tonic. So a tonic is something that can tonify your whole body and is pretty safe for most of us every day. Um, so we harvest this like other mints. It dries easily, but again, we wanna dry it low and slow. And delicious tear tincture, another one that's great for masking bitter flavors of herbs. And it's also another one that's great for herbal steams. So you can do that. You can also infuse it or the essential oil and make your own vapor rub, which is it's pretty easy. I mean, you could even um, just take some peppermint essential oil, combine it with another oil like coconut oil and just um, rub it on your chest and you'll get those vapors. Okay, so Tulsi or holy basil, same thing. Um, I put two botanical names in there because apparently it used to have this other name of Oxymum sanctum, and now it's Oxymum tenuiflorum. Unfortunately, this is like extremely frustrating <laughs> especially to botanists because these names have been changing a lot because they've been renaming plants based on DNA testing, which they were never able to do before. So just FYI, you can just throw those names out the window if you don't care about botany, that's fine. I would encourage to learn it though because it can be really helpful. So um, this is originally from India. There are several different varieties that you can grow but I think they're all incredibly helpful. You can research each one because some people say each one is a little bit different, but it's one of my favorite nervines. So for calming the nervous system, I've been drinking it every day, pretty much all day long, and it makes an extremely delicious tea. Um, so it grows easily like other mints. You can put it in a pot if you want. 
And again, we're gonna be harvesting the herbs of this so we can dry it and then strip off those leaves. And um, we can just keep harvesting it all season long while it's growing. And again, add it to other teas or, or tinctures um, for flavoring. Okay, uh oh, what just happened? Sorry, y'all, hold on a sec. Oh no. Sorry, hold on just one second. I had a, a little malfunction here. Okay, here we go. All right, so Echinacea. Um, this one is kind of controversial. We're gonna get into some controversy in our class, who knew? Uh, but anyway, um, Echinacea is often the first go-to when people think of immunity and it is wonderful and it is antiviral. It's a great antiviral, but um, it's not the only one. So that is kind of my beef with it. People tend to think of it as the only antiviral and there's so many other ones. Also, this one is threatened in the wild. So I want to encourage you to not harvest it in the wild and to grow your own. Um, it is closely related to like Rudbeckias, so like Black Eyed Susan. So if you ever grown those, it's pretty much the same as growing a Black Eyed Susan from what I know. And um, they do like well-drained soil. They will tolerate a drier soil. They like full sun and they're perennials, which is nice. And um, most people just harvest the roots of these, but actually the flowers and leaves are medicinal as well. So that's also a way if you find a big wild patch, you can just harvest some of the flowers and leaves and leave the roots to regrow. Also, like it's really important to think about sustainability when we're foraging and wildcrafting. So we never want to take more than, in my opinion, 10% of whatever's there. And that means like if there's a large patch, 10% of that patch. If there's a small patch, like 10 plants or less, we just leave it. If there's five to 10 patches of 10 plants, then I could feel comfortable taking like one out of every patch. Um, so this one is a little tricky because uh, it's not really safe usually for people who have autoimmune issues. So that's important to think about. It can cause a flare up. So if you have autoimmune issues, there are plenty of other antiviral herbs for you. And it's also not recommended to take for extended periods. This is kind of where the controversy comes in. Some people are like, it's fine for extended periods of time and they take it all the time. But what some people say is um, that you'll actually develop a tolerance to it and it won't work as well. And so I'll just take echinacea if I feel something coming on or if I'm around people that are sick. Um, but in a little bit, we're gonna talk about mushrooms and um, medicinal mushrooms, not magic mushrooms. Although plenty of people would say those are medicinal as well. But um, I prefer to take medicinal mushrooms every day as a tonic for my immune system. Oh, it's Kermit. I had to throw this in there for some levity. <laughs> Kermit. Okay, so. Here we go. So these are plants that can be wild harvested or they can be grown in your garden. And um, we're going to talk about a couple of species of plants in the genus Monarda that are called bee balm and bergamot. Sometimes those names are used interchangeably so it can get really confusing. So another reason to know the botanical names. And um, I put in this picture with the moth there because I feel like those moths are just amazing creatures. They're called hummingbird moths or sphinx moths. And they really do kind of look like tiny hummingbirds. They're really cool. But um, it's also a good reminder that these plants, um, if you kind of see like the tubular shape of the flowers, um, those, 
are really great for pollinators. So they support pollinators and bring them to your garden. And then I just love this picture on the bottom, the dandelion farm. <laughs> so it's just a good reminder to us that what lots of people call weeds are actually great medicine for us. Okay, so the balm. So again, as I said, like some people will call different species of these all bee balm or all bergamot, but um, I call the red species Monarda didyma bee balm. So just so you know, you can call it whatever you want because English names are just kind of picked randomly with like whoever said it and wrote it down. Uh, so this is the red flowered one and it is in the mint family as well, go figure. It is very antimicrobial, so it's a wonderful one to have around, and I feel like one that people don't talk about very much, and definitely not enough. It's extremely high in thymol. Thymol is a phytochemical, so a naturally occurring plant chemical um, that is also in thyme that's antimicrobial, but the Monardas actually have more thymol than thyme. It's so interesting. So, I love to grow it. It's so, as you can see, it's beautiful. We don't have that many bright red flowers, especially like wild native flowers um, that grow. And um, relatively easy to grow. It likes moist, rich soil, but it's nice because it will grow in partial shade or full sun. It's a perennial, but it really needs good airflow because it has a tendency towards something called downy mildew. So if the plants are too close together or they're in like a really wet area or an area that doesn't get much sun, they can often um, get this downy mildew that looks kind of like mildew. It's like little white spots on the leaves. And I don't like to harvest them when they look like that. So I'll just harvest the good looking ones. And um, you can harvest the tops. You could harvest them near the bottom and um, just leave a couple pairs of leaves on the bottom to regrow and just harvest right above that, that second to the last pair of leaves. Um, the flowers are edible and medicinal as well. So it's really beautiful. They dry really easily to so throw these um, flowers into tea. It's pretty gorgeous. Um, they, are also this plant is also called wild oregano and so i love to substitute it for oregano i will actually infuse it into salt and call it wild oregano salt and it's delicious um that is that in the book i don't think that's in my book but i actually have a new digital uh forage cookbook out on my website that has i believe that recipe in there along with the recipe for wild za'atar, like the um, Mediterranean spice. So um, you can make all kinds of yummy spices with this. And then you're putting it on your food, so you're getting that antimicrobial herb in your food, which is lovely. Uh, it's also called Osage tea because the Osage Native Americans made tea out of it a lot, and it was a substitute for black tea when the tea trade was difficult. So it's, it's really delicious as tea. You can also make it into a tincture. Wonderful for a throat spray. So if you have an achy throat, good for that. And I think that's everything on that one. I just, um, I'll dry the whole thing and the whole um, stem and I will, um, either strip the leaves if I don't have room for the stems or just cut them with scissors or pruners and um, just put it all into a jar or tincture it. So next we have wild bergamot. This flower is beautiful as well. So there's lots of varieties like cultivated varieties that you can get of this plant. Um, but this is the native wild one along with the other red ones. So you'll see lots of other colors like we saw in that first slide of the pink ones. So you can get them in different colors. But um, this one you will see wild or you can grow it, Monarda fistulosa. And um, also antimicrobial. It seems to grow wild more in full sun. So 
Uh, that's a little bit of a difference, but also a great pollinator plant. And um, the leaf stems and flowers are all medicinal. We can harvest all of those. And it's a little bit confusing because it's called bergamot. Some people think this is the flavoring for Earl Grey, but it's not. That's a citrus fruit. I have a feeling that um, somebody called it that because they thought it tasted similar. But again, wonderful in tea, tincture, throat spray, etc. Okay, moving on. Elderberries. So this one has got a lot of press. You probably all know it. And um, this is a picture of the flowers and the berries. And I thought it was pretty accurate. So I wanted to show this to you. Um, and point out that both parts are medicinal. And there is a way, that was my daughter back there. Um, there is a way that you can harvest the flowers while leaving the ovaries on the plant so that they will still create berries. So um, it's a little hard to explain here, but basically what I'll do is make my fingers into a claw and just kind of with my fingers as a comb, comb the petals off and they'll come off as one big piece because they're attached to each other, but it will have a hole in the center and that's because the ovary is left behind. So you can come back to those same plants later and get berries, which is really nice. Uh, and this is what the berries look like and the leaves. So this is me. My daughter took this picture of me. It's one of my favorite pictures. And um, I was actually in the river because they always grow near water when they're in the wild. So look near on stream banks, um, river banks, things like that by creeks or in like very moist woodlands and you'll see these growing oftentimes. Um, so you can also grow these yourself. You can often find them for sale uh, as the young plant and it does really like acidic soil though. So in Western North Carolina we already have acidic soil but if you don't you can amend your soil with things like pine needles or coffee grounds and it will help it out. But you do have to keep the soil pretty wet but also make sure that it's well drained. So these shrubs aren't growing in the river, they're growing on the bank where the water can drain off. They can tolerate being underwater for a while, but not forever. Uh, a good trick is to put bird netting over the berries, um, be like right when they're starting to come out or even before they start coming out because they'll come out one day and they'll just be gone because one day the birds will find them and they will eat them all and it will be really disappointing. So a really important thing to know is that the whole plant, except for the flowers and cooked berries, is poisonous. Um, don't, they have cyanide in them, so we don't want to eat the raw berries. They probably wouldn't kill you unless you ate quite a bit of them. But still, we don't want to eat them. Definitely not the leaves or the twigs or anything like that. Uh, the flowers, though, are great. And um, lots of people have been like, there's been this craze to make soda out of flowers. And there's also a liqueur that comes from the flowers that's called St. Germain. So if you know about that one. Uh, but the flowers are great for fevers. It's what's called a diaphoretic in herbalism. So it makes you sweat, which helps kill that bacteria um, or the virus that's causing your issues. Um, so the berries are also antiviral as well as the flowers and the berries have a ton of vitamin C in them and supposedly they do this magical thing where they can actually prevent the flu virus from entering your cells. It's amazing. So um, a lot of times we can't make claims about what herbs do, but this has been widely tested by an Israeli company, so we can say what it does. Um, so what else? Yeah, you can, I mean, elderberry syrup, right, is all the rage. I make it myself. 
Um, it's in my book, The Herbal Handbook for Homesteaders. There's a simple recipe. You can make it yourself. It's super duper easy and um, it costs way, way less if you make it yourself. It's crazy, like astronomically priced if you buy it at the store. So we can also dry the berries for tea. We can make tincture. We can make jelly or pie. Um, I've heard pie. I haven't tried that myself. But you have to be careful with autoimmune issues. It's not as um, serious as echinacea, but for some people, I've, I've asked around, and some people with autoimmune issues have issues with elderberry. Some people don't. Some people only have issues with it when they're having an autoimmune flare-up. So be very careful if you have autoimmune issues with elderberry. Mugwort. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> Not only because we share a name, but <laughs> that Artemisia part. Um, I also have it on a tattoo on my arm. Um, but because it's got so many wonderful benefits, there's a lot of related species. So if you know about wormwood, um, it is in the Artemisia genus. So is tarragon. So is sagebrush that grows out west. Um, so is another one called Sweet Annie, which is also a great medicine, and you can grow that one yourself. It doesn't grow wild around here very much, but you can grow it. And they all have pretty similar medicine. Um, they will grow wild, or you can grow them. So one of the identifying factors for me, which is why I like this picture, is you can see that one leaf that's turned over and how it's white. And so on the bottom of the leaf, they're white. And this is, um, to get a little spiritual woo-woo, this plant is associated with the moon and with Artemis, who is a moon goddess. And um, people say you can plant it in a moon garden so that when the moon is shining, those bottoms that are kind of whitish silver will like kind of shine in the moonlight. So that's pretty cool. Um, but it's antimicrobial. And it is also anti-malarial. So why would we care about that? Well, one, I mean, malaria is still a thing in the world today, but they're finding with COVID that some of the same herbs that work for malaria also work for um, COVID. So it's really good to know, I can't remember which country it was, but there is a country that swears that it's working for them for COVID. So something to think about. However, it's very, very bitter. Um, so if you're gonna drink it in tea, you might wanna mix it with other better tasting herbs. Um, also, I found out from my friend, Linda Black Elk, who I'm working with with my nonprofit. She is up um, in the Lakota lands in North Dakota that they, the Lakota people, um, take it for anxiety. So that's really amazing to know because again, we need as many of those anti-anxiety herbs as possible right now. You could also make a bitters blend. If you know about bitters, they help with digestion. Um, and then, so for a bitter tea, a tincture or what's called a fumatory. So some of you may no, not know that word, but you may have heard of smudge before. That refers to a Native American practice of burning herbs um, to like clear energy. But what they're also finding now in clinical research is that burning almost any herb can help and be effective at killing bacteria and virus in the air. So it's really awesome to see these things that have been done traditionally with herbs now coming out with scientific research that they work in all these other ways we didn't know. And so um, as people of European descent, I think it's good to think about how we use words that are traditionally Native American like smudge. So fumatory is a word that comes from Kind of older herbal medicine from Europe and uh, that's a good a good word to substitute and also to think about for those of us that have European heritage 
Um, we haven't evolved a whole lot since we left there. And so a lot of the European herbs like this one, uh, which is Eurasian, so native to Europe and Asia, um, can actually be, our bodies can actually be better adapted to those herbs. So that's something to think about. So for this one, we're gonna harvest what are called the aerial parts. So that's all the above ground parts. And um, we can also grow, you know, we can harvest it wild or we can grow it. This is another one that really likes to spread though. So just be aware of that. And um, I'll just dry this, put it in a jar, save it for later for tea or tincture or wrap it as like a fumatory type smudge stick like thing. And um, because it's in the aster family, anything that's in the aster family, we want to be careful because that's the same family as ragweed. And so anybody who has really bad ragweed allergies could have an allergy to anything else in that family. So start slow if you're worried about that. Okay, yarrow, another aster family member. It's got an interesting name, Achillea millifolium. And um, I forgot to put <laughs> why, like the related use um, or benefit in this explanation, but um, it got its name, the first part of its name, the genus Achillea is after Achilles because it actually, this plant, the leaves can stop bleeding. So it's called a styptic or a hemostatic. And so I really love to keep it in my first aid kit. This is like a little off track of antivirals, but um, you could just dry and powder the leaves and keep it in your first aid kit for that. It does really work. I've had good success with it. Uh, but yeah, named after Achilles because some people say it stopped the bleeding when he got shot in his heel. Uh, millifolium means thousand leaves because if you can see those leaves, they look like it's a thousand tiny leaves. Uh, but it's a great antiviral, good for fevers. It's another one of those diaphoretics, so it will make you sweat to sweat out whatever's going on, whatever kind of infection. It is a bitter, it's very bitter. Um, also, I wanted to let y'all know, because I think everybody should know, it's a great tick repellent. The military has done research that has showed that it's at least as effective, if not more effective than DEET at repelling ticks. You do have to apply it more often though. Um, that There's a recipe for the bug spray in my book, if you want that. And it does really like full sun. It will grow in drier soils, um, pretty easy to grow. It's a lot of herbalists specify that it's only the um, species with the white flowers, not the other varieties, that is medicinal. But then some people argue that's not true. So use your own judgment, do your own research. Um, this is one you wanna be careful with during pregnancy and again with those aster or ragweed allergies. And all of these herbs I'm talking about, whether I say so or not, if you're pregnant or nursing or have serious health conditions, you need to do your research before ingesting them. Okay, so the wild berberines. Um, I'm gonna take a sip because I've been talking for a long time. Okay. So wild berberines, um, berberine is another phytochemical. It's actually an alkaloid and um, it is in many of the plants in the barberry family and it's what gives them bright yellow roots. So not everything that has a yellow root has, ber has berberine, but a lot of them do. Um, so this picture right here is of golden seal. Golden seal has berberine. That's where the golden part comes from. And um, it is threatened in the wild. So I put this link right here to United Plant Savers. They do awesome work. And you can check out that link or just search United Plant Savers at risk list and you'll find this. And they have lists of the plants that are wild that are threatened or um, the ones that are to watch because they may become threatened. So 
don't harvest wild golden seal, please. But you can try and grow your own if you have rich woodland. Um, it's the ones in this family, especially with those yellow roots, are all very antimicrobial, including antiviral, antifungal, and antibacterial. And they're antiseptic. So you can make a wash out of them and put them on um, various topical issues. So even, I think I read things like MRSA, it's helpful for. Um, and then the part we're gonna harvest is the roots and the lower branches or stems. A lot of people don't know about this, but a lot of those lower branches and stems have as much berberine as the roots. So kind of cool. Okay, <laughs> it's another fun picture. This is like, I don't know where this came from, but um, what they're holding right there, those kids, is a little twig of barberry with the fruits. And those fruits are actually edible. I've heard of people making jams and jellies out of them. Um, but I wanted you to see this picture on the right, and this is why a lot of people plant this plant or grow it, because it turns this beautiful red color. However, it's pretty invasive. So an invasive plant is one that's not native. It's not native to wherever you are, and um, it grows really prolifically. So it can spread easily, and um, it's not great for the habitat. It takes over and crowds out native plants. It also can be detrimental to the native wildlife. So please don't plant barberry. You can remove it, and then while you're removing it, you can take that root and make medicine out of it. Um, you will also notice those big thorns. So I think that's why it's called barberry, because they're like big barbs. Um, and here's another invasive berberine plant. And this is Oregon grape. Some of you may know this one. It's not super invasive here. I don't feel like I don't see it a lot. As you go further south, I feel like I see it more. Um, and it used to be in the Mahonia genus, and now it's in the Berberis genus with barberry. It does get these edible berries on it. And um, those leaves are very much like holly leaves, like the American holly. And that's how it got its, the second part of its species name, aquifolium, which means leaves like holly. Kind of cool. So by harvesting invasives, again, we're helping the habitat and the wildlife. So you can harvest the roots of the Oregon grape or the lower branches and stem. Okay, so I really want to talk about mushrooms. And um, there are multiple antiviral species of mushrooms that we can grow or wild harvest. Uh, so you can look that up online. I wasn't going to name all of them, but uh, this is a picture of reishi. And you can grow reishi. It also, here in North Carolina, grows wild like crazy because it grows on the dying hemlock trees. So it's sad that our hemlocks are dying, but the silver lining is that we get this mushroom, which I feel like is one of the most medicinal mushrooms in the world. And then we don't have to go buy um, expensive reishi that comes from Asia. So um, it's, it's pretty amazing, really. And mushrooms are what's called immunomodulators. So if you had an autoimmune issue, you might wanna look into mushrooms because supposedly a lot of mushrooms are safe for people with autoimmune issues because what they do is they modulate the immune system, which means they take your immune system from where it is to where it needs to be. Um, so that could be up or down, depending. And what I've heard is that pretty much every wild mushroom is anti-carcinogenic. So some are still poisonous, but they're anti-carcinogenic. So that means that they can help prevent and fight cancer. So really good to know. Literally, I take mushrooms every day. Um, 
they can be ingested in tea. They really like need a lot of cooking though to bring out the, to extract those um, good chemicals in there. So if you're gonna drink them as a tea, you want to, like if you find them in tea bags, you're probably not gonna get very much of that out of that unless they've already heat extracted them. Um, so you would wanna like put them in a crock pot maybe and extract them for a long time, like 12 hours really at least. Um, what I do with them is called a double extraction tincture. So you're tincturing them, extracting them in alcohol, and you're then taking those mushrooms out of the alcohol and doing that long extraction in water. So like in the crock pot or on the stove. And then you're combining the two because they have natural chemicals and some are extracted better by water and some are extracted better by alcohol. So you really want both, if at all possible. You can also find them in capsules where they're already extracted. Um, so more antiviral medicinal mushrooms, oyster mushrooms. I just harvested some of those in the wild yesterday. They're delicious. They grow pretty much any time of year, honestly. They don't seem to like the really hottest part of the summer. Um, I'm in kind of a cooler part of the mountains, so it, we do find them in summer, but um, there are also several species. That's what that SPP means. Um, so there's like more of a winter or fall species and then a spring species and some others in between. But um, they're relatively easy to identify. They're really, really easy to grow. So people will often grow them in bags of sawdust. Um, yeah, so they're, they're also tasty and uh, you can eat them lots of different ways. I found some on Christmas day once on a hike with some friends and I made us all some gravy for Christmas dinner. So it's crazy. My mom's probably flinching because we're Jewish, but sometimes you gotta celebrate with your Christian friends. <laughs> um, anyway, shiitakes. People don't often think of shiitakes as medicinal, but they are. Um, I will tell you one thing about, well, I'll tell you lots of things about mushrooms. Um, even those little white button mushrooms that you find in the grocery store are medicinal, but actually for most of us, unless maybe you have some strong Russian heritage, most of us can't digest raw mushrooms. So you're just wasting your money if you're buying them and eating them raw. We really need to cook them first if we want to break them down and get the good stuff out of them. But shiitakes are also antiviral along with multiple other benefits and you can grow them relatively easily. So um, that I think is the end of my slideshow. Here's my book, The Herbal Handbook for Homesteaders. And again, if you're gonna buy it, I'd love it if you bought it from my website, thewanderschool.com so um, that I can keep more of the profit. And I'll also sign it for you or for whoever you want. Um, I have ongoing botanical education at patreon.com slash the wander school where you can get cool stuff like um, bonus podcast interviews and recordings of my book club that I do for my book. Um, those book clubs are the last Tuesday of every month on Facebook. They're for free, but you want the recording, you have to go to Patreon. Um, cool stuff from my kitchen and herbal remedy trips, tip, tips and tricks, <laughs> and uh, fun stuff like that. And you'll be supporting the nonprofit and getting the message out to everyone, the education. I have my podcast, Wander Forge and Wildcraft. You can find that on the website or pretty much any podcast platform where I interview foragers and wildcrafters and good old plant people all over the world. Um, also on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube as The Wander School. Probably something else I'm forgetting. But um, please feel free to get in touch. If you want to get a hold of me, my email address is abby at thewanderschool.com. Make sure you spell my name right, A-B-B-Y. And um, you can also just contact me from the website. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen.
And I would love to take questions. So um, I see here, I'm looking at the chat. So if you have questions you want me to answer or comments, I'd love to hear. It looks like some people have shared what they do with these herbs, which I love. Um, just type them in the chat. So if you go to the bottom of your screen and you see that little chat bubble, just click on that. So it looks like um, Heather said that they've been making lemon balm kombucha for acid reflux. It stops it within seconds. That's freaking amazing, Heather. Thank you so much for sharing. So this is a good reminder that all of you have something to share. So please feel free and put it in there because we can all benefit. I love that. I'm going to have to write that down. Um, Byron wants to know, oh, thank you so much for reminding me. Byron asked if I use mugwort as a dream tonic. Yes, I do. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up because there's so many great things about mugwort. I forgot to mention that. And so mugwort, you can um, bundle it, dry it, and burn it like a smudge or fumatory. And it helps not only clear the air energetically, um, help clear viruses and bacteria, but it also helps induce dreaming. You can also, I'll just harvest some of the fresh plant and put it under my pillow, and um, it will help with dreaming that way. However, be aware, for some people, it can be a little bit too strong. So I did hear this story of um, some people who had it growing on one side of their house and they actually had to move it because the people who lived on that, who had bedrooms on that side of the house actually couldn't sleep because their dreams were so vivid. So um, yeah, just, just be aware that might be a thing for you. But yeah, that's, that's like um, a pretty old medicinal thing. It's pretty cool. And um, yeah, you can make lots of, lots of neat things with it. So someone else was asking for the link for my book. So I'm gonna put it in the chat box right now, but if you're watching the recording, you can just go to thewanderschool.com and go to the products page and you can find it right there. But here it is in the chat box. Uh, let's see. Byron says, thanks. You're so welcome. Um, okay. Hallie is asking, I live in the Midwest. Do you recommend a local supplier of seeds or roots for planting? Yes, Hallie, there's so many. Go Midwest. Um, <laughs> so it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, my friend Doug Crouch of um, Tree Yo Permaculture has um, a nursery at his place in Kentucky. It's in Northern Kentucky, so it's just outside of Cincinnati. And um, he sells a lot of native and common permaculture plants. So I'll try to... Um, put his information up here for you. I'm trying to think what else. Um, in Cincinnati, there is a place, oh God, um, let me see if I can remember. Oh, Keystone Flora. So here's, whoops, that didn't do it. Hold on just a sec. Uh, getting you that Trio Permaculture link. And you can also ask him too. He is really a wonderful person and he'll respond to you if you send him a message and just ask him where to get certain plants. He is great at that. Um, type in Keystone Flora. I don't have the link to that, but um, that's another option. I think Baker Seeds maybe is in the Midwest as well. And um, it might be, I can't remember. I'll put that, that one up for you, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. And then, uh, what's the other one? Is it companion plants or useful plants? I always forget which one is here and uh, which one is in Ohio. 
but um, maybe look that up. Uh, it looks like useful plants is in the southern Appalachians. So I think, yeah, they're in Black Mountain. So that's a place to go um, for plants around here in North Carolina. I'll put that in the chat box. And then um, Companion Plants, I believe, is the name of the other place in Ohio that's a little bit further north. So there's lots of options for you. Um, also, if you want medicinal herb seeds, um, there is a friend of mine who um, has a wonderful company called Strictly Medicinal Seeds. And it used to be called Horizon Herbs. So if you knew them then, um, it's now called Strictly Medicinal. And they're really wonderful. They propagate a lot of the herbs themselves. Richo Check is um, one of the owners. He also wrote a fabulous book that I would recommend to everybody besides my book, <laughs> who's getting into herbalism. It's called Making Plant Medicine. You can also get that on the Strictly Medicinal Seeds website. Um, really wonderful for learning how to make all kinds of medicines and learning what the benefits of the herbs are. So, Diana says, thank you, you're welcome. Um, anybody else have any questions for me? This is your opportunity. Holly says, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> so yeah, you have me here right now. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about myself to somebody who puts a question in there, but we'll just go a few more minutes. And um, I just wanna tell you that I offer a lot of education online. So if you can support on Patreon, Patreon that's great. I'm gonna type that link in here. You'll get all kinds of cool bonuses, including the Wild Life Forage Cookbook at the $10 a month level. Um, and I have um, my last podcast interview on Wonder Forage and Wildcraft was with the crazy botanist, my friend who's a black botanist, Derek Haynes. And we talked about the plant's impact on black people and black people's impact on the plant. So if you haven't listened to that, please do. I also posted on Instagram a recording of a discussion we had um, recently talking about gardening indoors and all kinds of other fun things. So you can check that out. No one else has a question, really? It could be about herbs, it could be about foraging, be about antiviral herbs. Okay, well, I really appreciate all of you so much. Um, if you missed some of this recording, it will be up on Bountiful City's site and it will also be up somewhere on one of my various platforms. So um, hopefully on my website. But thank you so much to all of you for being here and please stay healthy and I hope to see you soon. Um, Issa, do you have anything else to say? I don't, I just wanna say thank you to you and another thank you to everyone else. And um, yeah, look for this, uh, I'll, I'll more than likely post in the Facebook event page uh, when, we, when we have this video live. And um, yeah, thank you everybody.